This episode of The Startup Life is brought to you by People Ready. Startup Nation, you have a lot on your plate. The last thing you need to stress about is finding quality staff or the available work you need to be successful. Save time and headache by working with a trusted staffing partner that meets your everyday needs. People Ready is a national staffing provider with over 600 locations across the country and 30 plus years of experience serving people just like you. They specialize in a variety of industries including retail, manufacturing, logistics, general cleaning, hospitality, construction, and more. People Ready understands that you're busy and on the go. That's where their mobile app, JobStack, comes in. Use the app to place orders or find work 24-7 or wherever you are. And as social distancing continues to change the way we interact with customers, colleagues, and our everyday lives, JobStack provides the ability to find the right temporary workers or work you need while eliminating the amount of physical touch points needed in the staffing process. Visit PeopleReady.com forward slash Startup Life to learn more about how you can partner with People Ready. This episode is sponsored by Swanson Health. Startup Nation, Swanson Health has been producing quality vitamins and supplements, foods, healthy home, and self-care products for over 50 years. Since 1969, from the heart of America, Swanson Health carries over 20,000 wellness products at a great value. Pick up all of your favorite health products, plus discover new ones for your wellness routine, all while leaving money in your pocket. If you want to try any of Swanson Health's great products for yourself, use code STARTUP20 for 20% off at swanson.com. We have a link there in the show notes if you listen to the replay on the podcast. It's time to be about that life. The Startup Life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career-minded professionals. You know, Startup Nation, as we engage and we engage, you know, go through this new normal, the coronavirus, COVID-19, or whatever you want to call it, you know, there's a lot of businesses that are kind of going through some fluctuations. They're going through changes and stuff like that. And I imagine the, the valuations of those businesses or what, you know, or what people value them as is probably changing and fluctuating uh, with that as well, which is why we have a great guest to kind of help us figure out all of that for sure. He is a graduate at Loyola Marymount and has an MBA at the University of Chicago. He is a partner at McKinsey and Company and a core leader of the corporate finance practice. During his more than 28 years of consulting, he has served clients globally on value creation, corporate strategy, corporate market issues, and M&A transactions. He is also the lead author of Valuation, Measuring and Managing the Value of Companies. This book, Startup Nation, is now in its seventh edition and has sold more than 800,000 copies. It is actually used, Startup Nation, as a textbook for the top business schools such as Wharton, University of Chicago, MIT, and that book is actually out today, Startup Nation. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you want to uh, you listen to the replay on the podcast. My friends, welcome, Tim Kohler. Tim, how's it going, my man? Good. Thank you for having me, Dominic. No worries. Are you ready to pour some knowledge in the Startup Nation today? Because we can surely use some, my man. I'm looking looking forward to it. All righty. So before we kind of get this thing popping, if you would, just kind of share with us your origin story and your background on your career so far. I, I started my career with one of the big oil companies and then moved on to a very con- small consulting firm called uh, Stern Stewart, which actually was one of the first organizations to rig- rigorously uh, apply academic finance theory to practical finance valuation type problems. Okay. Um, and so that was really the foundation of when I got involved in um, really thinking hard about how companies create value and, and, and both how to measure it and how to improve value creation. Uh, and then after a couple of years there, I left to join McKinsey as we were starting up our uh, corporate finance practice, uh, and that's where I've been for 30 years now, uh, is, uh, is at McKinsey working with clients, helping them to uh, think about or helping them to develop strategies uh, to, to create value for the shareholders. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. I, I want to ask you this, you know, because you, you majored in economics and stuff like that. Have you always been one who kind of valued how, 
you know, uh, trends are kind of uh, looked at or you've you always been a numbers person. Kind of share with me a little bit how maybe you were as a kid and as a student. Uh, I was always pretty numbers oriented. Okay. Um, and I think one of the things that in particular is that uh, I'm a, I have a strong interest in sort of if you will, history, uh, uh, economic history, if you will. Okay. And, and I think that shapes a lot of our thinking because I think a lot of uh, times people uh, either forget, you know, the lessons of the past or they're too young to remember uh, the lessons of the past. And so I think there's a great benefit to uh, understanding the 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 numbers, if you will, of the past. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. And I imagine there's always something we can learn from that for sure. Uh, I want to ask you this because, you know, and you kind of mentioned this early, we're always hearing like, you know, uh, shareholder value have, you know, make sure we're maximizing shareholder value and stuff like that. I want to ask you this. Why is that so important? Because, I mean, when you think about a company, you know, there's like other stakeholders involved, right? Like you have like, you know, the employees, you have vendors and all this other stuff. Why is maximizing shareholder value usually the one, uh, not necessarily the most important, but that's the one that gets emphasized a lot? Yes. Um, well, the reason shareholder value gets emphasized is because ultimately the shareholders are the ones who are taking the risks and, gotcha. uh, uh, in, in, in the enterprise. So. It is important for management to look out for the interests of the shareholders. That said, though, um, the work we've done says that for the most part, there is not any inconsistency. And in fact, there is consistency between uh, doing a good job for all your constituents, for all your stakeholders, right. and long-term shareholder value creation. So you know, if you don't have satisfied customers who come back with because you have great products, great customer service... Um, you're not going to create value over the longer term. Gotcha. Uh, if you don't innovate, if you don't have satisfied, uh, ha happy employees who are productive and enthusiastic about working for you, um, if you don't have a good safety record, uh, there's a lot of evidence that shows that companies who don't look after those constituents who or who are careless about the environment typically don't create value over the longer term. They may create value uh, in the very short term, right. you know, it's easy. It's easy to make your numbers look good for the next year or so, uh, in in a way that investors can't see what's going on, and that maybe these numbers aren't really healthy. Um, gotcha. And so it's easy to sort of pump up your share price in the short term, um, but that's different than long term value creation, which is what we focus on. You know, we recently talked to uh, David Cote, the former. CEO of Honeywell, and he talked about having like this duality uh, between not not just focusing on the short term, but also kind of focusing on the short term and the long term, uh, you know, mm -hmm. for a company and, and stuff like that, which I thought was fascinating because, you know, even right now with businesses dealing with, you know, the coronavirus and, uh, you know, and the re I guess the recession that we're kind of in, depending on who you mm -hmm. ask and stuff like that, you know, a lot of times we're just out putting out fires, especially as small business owners, you know, so mm -hmm. when you're advising, you know, these, these big corporations and your clients and stuff like that, how do you get them to see not just the putting out of the fires, but also that long-term perspectives, even with everything going on? I think that's a matter of really having, taking clear stock of your situation okay. and figuring out what type of company you are. Uh, I sometimes like to think about them and, and, and there's sort of three types of companies right now in terms of how they're affected by the current pandemic. Uh, there are companies that are just fighting for survival, right? Right. Um, and they have to do everything they can in the short term. And, and uh, 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 you know, that's that's got to be their primary focus for the next several months, at least, right? Right. Uh, then there are some companies that are, that the impact is is minor, or in some cases, some com companies are benefit benefiting from it. Right. right. Uh, and there we think, and we've, we've talked to investors about long-term sophisticated investors about this. And there, you know, we believe that um, the, uh, the, what you have to do is you have to look out for your stakeholders, right? Because when we come out of this, you'll come out stronger if you've taken care of your stakeholders during the crisis. Mm. And what by, what we mean by that is clearly, the safety and security of your employees is absolutely one thing that you have to be looking out after. 
right? Right. Um, because people have long memories, uh, and if they don't, if you don't treat your employees well during this period of time, it will come back to get you later on. Right. And the same thing with customers and suppliers, right? You want to make sure that your suppliers also make it through the crisis. Right. So you may want to work with your suppliers who are weaker than you to make sure you make it through the crisis, uh, maybe by um, you know, be financial support or contracts or something like that to, to, to help them to make sure that when, we, when the economy does turn around, that they're in a position to, 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 to supply you with what the raw materials and services that you need to produce your product. And the same thing with your customers, particularly if you're a business-to-business customer, uh, uh, particularly if you're a business-to-business company where your, your, your clients are other businesses and particularly small businesses, um, you want to make sure that they're still around after the crisis. Um, so it is important to look out for all your stakeholders during this period of time. It's also important if you do have the liquidity and strength to see if you can use this time to uh, strengthen your position, uh, maybe save versus your competitors. Now's not the time to cut back on innovation, right? Uh, you know, you don't want, because the economy needs innovation and, and we don't want to, you know, slow it down by a year because of the pandemic if we don't have to, right? Absolutely. Um, so you want to invest in innovation. Um, you want to, um, you know, continue to improve the operations of the business, improve your customer service and, and learn something from, you know, a lot of companies are learning how to do things better as a result of the virus, uh, uh, the, the, the thing. And so, you know, how do you make sure you keep those things gone? So we often would argue, argue that companies should have not only a team that's dealing, you know, a management team that's dealing with the current situation, but a team that's in a way planning ahead. You could call it a plan ahead team, right? right. Where, where the team is sort of saying, okay, as we come, you know, that, that is not distracted by what's going on immediately, but is thinking, what do we need to do to make sure that we're in the best position longer term uh, in terms of our stakeholders and, uh, you know, our innovation it could even mean attracting talent right now, right? Okay. Um, you know, if you've got, you know, if you're doing okay um, and some competitors maybe are weaker or they're not treating their talent, their, their employees as well, maybe it's a good time to, to bring on some talent that you might have otherwise had difficulty uh, to bring on. So there's a lot of opportunities that companies that are in a stronger position can take, take advantage of that um, will, you know, help the economy and help them as well as we come out of this out of this situation. So that's the that's the second extreme. And then you've got companies in the middle that obviously have to, you know, that that aren't don't aren't as as strong a position, but aren't you know existentially threatened uh, either. And they you know have to figure out what they're you know, they should you know try to do the same things that the companies that are stronger are doing as much as they can. They'll have to make some harder trade-offs, so because they probably can't do everything that a, that a strong company can do. Absolutely, thank you for sharing that. You know, you you, you mentioned something that, uh, that was very interesting because when we talk to startup nation, we talk about downturns, recessions, and stuff like that. We always say this is a great time for like professional development and stuff like that to kind of retool and refocus uh, as the downturn, because you know, so that way when we kind of you know get out of this, you know, you're hit the ground running. But I didn't think about the hiring of talent. Uh, part. And mm-hmm. I thought that was a very interesting part. And so, you know, are, are you kind of recruiting the same way? Like, how does that look in you know, during a recession? Yeah, and, and and it really depends upon the the, the type of company you are. For sure. Uh, but um, you don't necessarily need to have um, uh, to hire extra, say, administrative people, which are gotcha. which aren't as specialized, right? Right. When we're talking about talent, we're talking about people with unique capabilities, particularly uh, scientists and engineers uh, who are going to be behind innovation, right? Right. Um, those are the kinds, you know, the kinds that don't come along very often and, 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 and you need to sort of bring those on board. Um, and also you want to, like we've made a, you know, there are some firms that, are, you know, banks and stuff like that, that are one, you know, uh, and law firms and others that are laying off some of their talent. And our, our business, for example, as a consulting firm is, is based on talent. And, and if our talent isn't satisfied and if we don't have the right levels of talent, when we come out of this, then, then we'll be at a disadvantage. So, 
know, we're willing to perhaps be a little bit overstaffed, if you will, for, the, for, for, for a while in order to make sure that we do have the right talent and we don't, you know, and, and we have a reputation for taking care of our talent. Um, so we think all those things are, are, are important. So, you know, we would never in a, in a situation like this, not honor offers that we've made or, or things like that. We're working very hard to find opportunities for people to grow in the current environment. Uh, and I think that's what the best companies will do is we'll try to do things to retain the scarce talent that will be necessary for their, for their long-term success, particularly those who are innovators, those who are key in sales and marketing, um, uh, key operating managers who have unique skills um, in terms of uh, operating plants or, you know, motivating people, those kind of things. It's really the key people that you want to make sure you you are keeping and, and, and perhaps retaining or perhaps acquiring more of during this period of time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing all of that. I, I want to ask you this, Tim, because when we told people that we were going to have uh, you know, you on the show and we told them about your background and stuff like that. One of the things they kept asking me uh, was, hey, you got to ask him this. When we see uh, a place like Hertz and you see a place like uh, and that there's a big name retailer, I can't even think of it right now. Uh, uh, or like a Chuck E. Cheese where, you know, they're going out of business or they file off a bankruptcy. Chuck E. Cheese now has, I believe, like a billion dollars in debt and was trying to get $200 million uh, to just kind of stay afloat. I think for those of us who are small business owners and we see these big corporations kind of falling by the wayside, one of the questions we ask is like, how does that happen? You have all this revenue, you have all this, and you have all these things going for you. How in the world did it take a pandemic to kind of like, you know, take you out, if you will. So I, I, obviously you don't work at those places, but I'm curious, you know, even though the numbers are bigger than a small business, how does mm-hmm. something like that happen? What happens in a situation like this is um, typically it's, it's, it accelerates uh, a long-term process that's already going on and weakening these companies, Fair right? Enough. Right. In many com- in many cases, the companies that are experiencing the most difficulties right now um, well, either there's one of two things going on, either yeah. or sometimes both. Either their business model was already in decline, right? Okay. And this just accelerated it, right? So instead of going bankrupt, you know, three years from now, you know, they're going bankrupt now instead, right? right. Uh, because they haven't they haven't they they haven't kept up with what consumers want, for example. Uh, or, or, the, or the way consumers are behaving or what's important to consumers. So one of the reasons that you see this happening is because these are companies which were already weak mm. before this started, right? You don't, you don't see companies, very few companies that were, uh, you know, except for maybe some of the, except for maybe airlines and stuff like that, which, right. you know, which are, which is a special case. Right. But in many of the, many of the companies that are experiencing difficulties, were already uh, weak to begin with in terms of the trends were going, the long-term trends were going against them, right? right. Uh, particularly, let's say retail and other things like that, where you know shift to online and, uh, purchasing and stuff like that has happened. The other thing that has happened simultaneously with that is some of these companies um, have take had, simply had too much debt as well, mm. right? As they were weakening. Uh, companies typically that are strong and growing um, try to minimize the amount of debt that they have, right? Uh, but what you find is that companies, as their business model gets weaker, uh, sometimes they um, uh, take on they take on too much debt to try to keep parts of it alive that maybe should should be shut down Fair enough. faster, right? Right. Uh, or sometimes they've done trans, or sometimes they've gone through a leveraged buyout or something like that, where they've gone private with a lot of debt. Um, and you know, these are industries which just don't work very well with lots of debt. And so the the two things that are driving the larger companies that have difficulties right now, in many cases are, you know, a business model that was already somewhat weak and often too much debt. Got you. Thank you for sharing that. Cause like I said, we see, we see like these companies name and lights and they're like big businesses across the country. And then you see something like this and you just kind of like, you know, how did that happen? So I appreciate you sharing all of that for sure. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to ask you this um, as well, because 
as we move forward, you know, and we're like kind of in a recession and stuff like that, and we had the one in 2008, are there any similarities or is this thing with COVID-19 just something we've just never seen before when it comes to uh, 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 economic downturn, if you will? Yeah, it's it's every economic downturn has certain industries which are driving it typically. Okay. Um, usually, and it's usually driven by the financial excesses in the financial sector, right? Uh, often related to real estate. You know, if you look at the uh, the the one we had two thousand eight and two thousand nine, that was driven by real estate. Um, if you look, go back, we had real estate driven crises uh, in the. Um, 70s, 80s kind of thing. We had uh, other things like that. Um, this one is different in the sense that in, 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 in a couple of major ways. Um, one is um, it is not driven by an ex- excess in one, uh, you know, overcapacity in some part, some sector, right? Basically, what we had in 2008 is we had too much money being lent to for houses that the homeowners you know, probably couldn't afford and shouldn't have bought in the first place, right? Right. So we had, you know, an excess in the real estate market, right? That had to be corrected. Um, and that had to work its way. And that had a big effect on the financial institutions, which then sort of spread through the economy. And, and, and that's often the, 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 the driver. We had a very mild recession in 2001 after the dot-com bubble. Right. Um, when that, we had excesses there. So coming into this one, this one's not driven by an imbalance or an excess in some part of the economy as the, as the recessions often are. Right. Right. It's, 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 this is, this is one that's affect. It's more like a war, if you will. Right. Mm, okay. Uh, in the sense that, um, it comes on suddenly, uh, and it's not driven by an imbalance in the economy. Um, and it hits a lot of sectors all at once that have nothing to do with the, the sectors, not, those, those industries having done something wrong or having built over capacity or whatever. Gotcha. So in that sense, it's, it, it is very different. Right. Um, and it's also very unique in the sense that it has hit hard, you know, those sectors, which have um, lots of employees. And so that sort of, you know, reduces, um, the, the consumer buying power, which reverberates throughout the economy. So you have a lot of things happening all at once in a very extreme way that we haven't experienced before, um, which is why, you know, there are so many different points of view about how the turnaround may occur and how long it will take because we haven't experienced something like this before. So we don't, we don't know what's happened in past ones like this and we don't know uh, what the right policy prescriptions are for, for, for a situation like this. Got you. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. Once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to Tim Kohler, the lead author of Valuation, Measuring and Managing the Value of Company. So I want to ask you this because this is the, the seventh edition uh, of your book. And, you know, it, it's been adopted by, like we talked about earlier, uh, some of the top business schools in our country. Now, I guess I'm curious, you know, what is it about this book that's, you know, that's just resonated with uh, these schools to adopt this book and to make it so evergreen because, you know, obviously you have to update it over time because, you know, things mm-hmm. change and stuff like that. But why, uh, why have schools adopted this book so well? I think the reason schools have adopted it and, and also, you know, it's often read by other professionals as well, sure, bankers, sure. uh, corporate executives and those, those kind of things. And, 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 and I think it somewhat goes back to the history of how, how the book came about. Okay. Um, we didn't start out to write a book. What, what, what we did was we set, set out to write a handbook for McKinsey consultants, right? Mm. On how to do and how to think about value creation, uh, because okay. there wasn't something that we found adequate out there in the market. Um, what we found was that the academic books, the, the books written by academics didn't have enough practical detail in them so that you couldn't, you know, a Monday morning get, the, you know, sit down and know exactly what to do with the company's financial statements. Right. Gotcha. Um, and a lot of the practitioner books weren't grounded in solid economic and financial theory. Right. Okay. And evidence. OK. And so what we did was we brought those things together. Right. Into something that, you know, was both the foundations are, 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 are solidly graded and uh, so, solid, solidly grounded in economic and financial theory that's been, you know, well 
documented, but at the same time, it's very practical. It shows you exactly how to analyze a company's financial statements uh, using those principles. Okay. But with you know, we we also understand the nuances of accounting rules, right? And so when we update the book, for example, this year we up this most recent update, the accounting rules for for operating leases changed, right? So we had to make those changes. So we we also are aware of all of the technical accounting issues and the and the strategic issues. So we bring all these things together, I think, in one book. And so it crosses finance, economics, uh, accounting, and strategy, uh, which I think makes it unique in a very practical way. And 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 um, that's why I think it's 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 been so successful. Gotcha. I hear that. Tim, if you would, because, you know, you're the lead author, which means there's other authors that you work with. So talk about, you know, because a lot of times we have people who come on the show and it's kind of like a singular thing when they write a book. Right. But, you know, you talking about three authors here. So talk about how that process was, you know, because, you know, you're three different people, three different doctrines, three different values about how, you know, uh, things should go. So kind of walk me through that process. What was that process like? Yeah, well, it's interesting because actually, the the three author it, the first edition also had three authors but different ones. Fair okay? enough. Okay. Uh, I was one of the I, I've been the only author who's been on the book for the entire period of time. Got it. Um, and I was probably because I was the youngest author at the time the first one came out. Fair enough. Right. Um, first of all, we had a goal, you know, in mind that we started this out to help the, our consulting practice, right, mm-hmm. uh, and do better work. And we spent a lot of time together hashing things out, right? Okay. Uh, he, heated debates, late nights, et cetera, uh, to try to come up with something, um, you know, and, and also drawing a lot on our other colleagues in the firm, right, who sure. are doing work with clients. So we had a lot of help. We have a lot of uh, other consultants in the firm. You know, if you look through the acknowledgments, you see this vast numbers of consultants who help us do analysis who give us ideas, who read chapters and give us advice. So it is a, it is a big undertaking with lots of people involved. Um, it, for the fourth edition, we changed the co-authors. Um, and I, and I, you know, invited two, uh, co-authors who I know, uh, uh, Mark Goodhart, uh, who's at McKinsey still Mm -hmm. and David Wessels, who's a professor at Wharton, who was at McKinsey, uh, very early in his career for a couple of years. I knew them both. And I knew that, um, you know, they were the, you know, uh, they were the kind of thinkers that we needed. Right. Okay. Uh, and so the fourth edition, we spent a ton of time together, you know, learning how to work together, learning how to come up with a, the right kind of style, the right kind of uh, uh, level of detail, et cetera, and, 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 and debates because we all came at it from slightly different angles, right? right. Um, but, you know, I think that the, 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 the result of that was, was very successful. Uh, we've now been working together for, 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 for quite a few years. Um, and, um, you know, the, for example, the, the first edition that the three of us worked together on was the fourth edition of the book. Uh, we 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 spent physically time together a lot Got of it. it right okay uh this last edition because we've been working together for so long we spent very little physical time together mm. um because we can work together now remotely even before the the pandemic right. uh we we were doing that because you know we know each other um and um you know we we know how we agree how we disagree how to argue in a productive way um uh, so that the end result is always better. Right. Right. Um, so it's just, it's a matter of, uh, you know, working with people who that, you know, that aren't, you know, you don't want to work with clones, right. right? Cause then that you win you, but you want to work with people who, um, you know, have the same basic underlying principles, um, the same basic philosophies, but who can also, you can debate some of the specifics, and by debating those things, uh, uh, do do uh, do a better job. And then we also, re- as I said, rely on a lot of other people at McKinsey to help us with analyses and with different chapters where they have some expertise. So it's a it's a you know it's a it's a big group effort. Absolutely, absolutely. And 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 I love that you talked about how you built that cohesion over time to where even something like not being physically together still allows you to kind of. Uh, produce some great content and a great book. So I appreciate you sharing that also uh, as well, Tim. 
Thank you. No worries. No worries. So I want to ask you uh, about this. There's a chapter in the book, you know, mergers and acquisitions. And we hear, you know, mergers and acquisitions, M&A all the time in the business world. If you listen to Bloomberg or CNBC and stuff like that, if you would kind of walk us, you know, take us behind the scenes of like, you know, what that looks like when a, one company says, hey, I want to join forces or, hey, I want to acquire you or something like that. What do some of those conversations sound like, Tim? Well, what's interesting is that they're 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 very different okay. um uh, depending upon the circumstances um because i've been you know through my career i've seen many of them and um you know the 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 range of those conversations is is all over the place um and i think it's important to distinguish between you know very large uh mergers or acquisitions you know we have two large companies coming together um, versus, um, you know, a larger company buying a smaller company. Right. Those two, those two kinds of things are, 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 are very different. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it also depends upon, you know, the, the more, I also distinguish it between the more successful and the less successful, right. Mm. Uh, the more successful large acquisitions, you know, focus, uh, very much on identifying what the two companies can do together better than that, that they could do separately. Right. Right. Um, you know, so for example, maybe one is strong in one country and another strong in another country, but their products could be sold in both. Mm -hmm. Right. So they can work together to expand that. Um, or maybe there is some, um, excess capacity in the industry that they can, they can reduce. Um, there's a lot of, you know, so, but they really need to spend time, I think, the better ones thinking about those kinds of issues, right? Right. Uh, and, and, and really focusing on the strategic rationale uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the benefits that come about from the merger or acquisition, right? As opposed to, I mean, the, the other, you know, there are plenty of uh, uh, acquisitions and merger where they spend all the time talking about uh, deal structures and, you know, who's going to have what jobs and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, that that's the wrong focus, right? Um, but you, you know, you do see that sometime as well. Um, uh, what I find is that you can, you know, you can tell by the way the company announces the acquisition um, and the specificity with which they talk about it, how well they've thought through the strategy and what the benefits are going to be. Gotcha. Right. So the, the, the better ones focus on that when you're buying a smaller company also, um, you know, there, there's two kinds of acquisitions of smaller companies. There are those that are, those are companies that are sold and there's a companies that are bought, right? The best ones are ones where the large company already has a relationship with the smaller company. Okay. They know the management team. There's trust between them. Um, they know how they would work together. Um, those are often a lot more successful uh, because they don't go to an auction. And then there are those where, you know, the, the company is just put up by, you know, and bankers go around and try to shop it, right? And it's very impersonal, you know, um, uh, and, you know, they're basically just trying to get the highest bidder, right? right? So, so those have a very different, those kind of transactions have a very different feel to them than when the parties already know each other, have worked together, uh, and are, you know, you know, can quickly and trust each other already. Got you. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. Quick follow up, if I could, because, you know, when you see, you know, mergers and acquisitions and, and we look you know, from afar and we're looking on the business news channel and stuff like that, you know, I, I'm curious to know this in your career. Have you ever seen one of those kind of transactions where you was like, wow, I didn't see that one coming or, it, you know, it seemed like it was a match made in heaven and it just broke down or. And on the forefront, it's kind of like, uh, that ain't going to work. And then it actually does work. Have you ever seen anything where that's kind of surprised you? Um, not too many that surprised me okay. um, it, from the perspective of working if there, if, if, you know, because usually you can tell by the way they talk about what they're going to do okay. uh, and what they're going to accomplish. Um whether they've really thought it through or not. Now that said, uh, what does surprise me sometimes is often what, what, what the value comes from an acquisition is it shakes up both companies, um, creates a sense of urgency and it allow and it, and it allows them to do things differently and capture value that just because it, 
has created this sense, you know, putting together companies is two companies together is hard, right? Right. And so sometimes it's just both companies could have used improvement, right? And this was a catalyst to make that happen. Gotcha. So you may say, yeah, this may not have made sense, but the, the, the pure event of combining and all the work that has to get done and, and rethinking things, you know, created an opportunity to, 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 to sort of create value when maybe it didn't appear that there was some uh, initially. So you do see that happen from time to time. And that's why we, we often tell companies to look beyond sort of the initial synergies that they're thinking about and use an acquisition or a merger as an opportunity to step back and, 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 and really change the way you do things sometimes. Because this is a one, you know, a, a, a once in many year opportunity to make some big changes to your own business as well. Uh, so that's one of the surprises that, 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 that sometimes occurs. All right, Startup Nation. So we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. We got to pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson and you're listening to The Startup Life. This episode of The Startup Life is tucked in nice and tight by Philip Stein and the Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet. Startup Nation, getting quality sleep is super important, especially for those of us as entrepreneurs. I know for me, if I don't get enough quality sleep, not only do I not perform well while working in my business or exercising, but also it really affects my mental health and that doubt starts to creep in. And that's the last thing we want as entrepreneurs. Also, with everything going on, good quality sleep is important to repair the body and support a good immune system. And that is why Startup Nation, I wear the Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet. The Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet uses natural frequency technology to reinforce our biomagnetic field to improve deep sleep, length of sleep, and overall sleep quality. This helps produce a healthier heart, regulate weight control, and helps strengthen the immune system, which helps destroy bacteria and viruses. Right now, when you go to philipstein.com, use code SLEEPEZ, and you will get 10% off the entire store. That's promo code SLEEP, capital E, capital Z. So if you are ready to be more productive in leading your business, go with the Philip Stein Sleep Bracelet, proven to be natural and safe to give you a better, deeper sleep. This episode of The Startup Life is brought to you by the Risk Management Society. Startup Nation, the Risk Management Society, or RIMS, is a global organization dedicated to the profession of risk management. For nearly 60 years, RIMS has delivered the latest strategies and resources that allow risk professionals to grow, innovate, and succeed in any business. RIMS works with industry leaders to produce content and online training that business professionals turn to. Topics include business continuity, cyber risk, risk management techniques, the fundamentals of insurance, and more. There is also a private members-only site where people can discuss sensitive issues and get honest answers. Members have been leaning on each other as we all navigate this global pandemic. If you're concerned about the safety of your employees and the sustainability of your organization, you need the resources and connections RIMS provides. Learn more at go.rims.org forward slash startup life. If you're listening to the replay on the podcast, we have a link there in the show notes. You can save 25% off a year long membership. So if you're ready to get the resources and strategies you need to manage risk, go with RIMS and join their global network of over 10,000 members across more than 60 countries. Support for The Startup Life is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-belt grooming. Startup Nation, personal grooming is super important, not only from a hygiene standpoint, but also from a confidence one as well. And that is why you need to have a tight haircut and, well, a nice groomed undercarriage as well. And when doing that, you don't want to use the same razor, do you? That's just absurd. And this is why our friends at Manscaped have given you another option. Introducing the all-new Lawnmower 3.0 by Manscaped. 
This lightweight and waterproof razor features precision engineered blades for safe trimming in sensitive areas and a 7,000 RPM motor with quiet stroke technology. Ladies, Father's Day is just around the corner and this will make a perfect gift for that guy on the go. Use code the Startup Life in all caps for 20% off and free shipping on your brand new Lawnmower 3.0 at manscaped.com. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access if you're listening to the replay on the podcast. And while you're there, be sure to check out all the other products from manscaped.com as well. So for proper manscaping without the fear of hurting anything go with manscape trust me your family of jewels will thank you all right startup nation welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on the startup life you know tim i was looking at a, a video that you were featured on and you were talking about how sometimes there's like the surface of like you know what's going on and then there's the underlining features you i think you gave the example of the s p 500 at the time when you were recording that video and you was talking mm-hmm. about how it you know it's it's doing well but it like the but when you look underneath it all, how there was basically four companies, not necessarily propping up the other ones, but while having a strong, significant pull on what those numbers uh, look right. like. I, I guess I'm just curious, you know, why is that important to not just go for the snapshot? You know, when you're making business decisions or whatever the case may be, when you're not that's just to go for the snapshot, but to dig a little deeper into the numbers, into what you're digging into in order to make, uh, basically to in order to do your uh, due diligence, if you will, before you make a decision. Yes. Uh, and it's the same with whether you're looking at, you know, the S&P 500 or whether you're looking at um, um, a company, right? So if you're okay. looking at a company, let's just say you're looking at a company, though. Most larger companies are composed of smaller business units, right, that okay. may have different products, different geographies, um, and uh, what we off, what you'll typically find when you go into a company, right, and, and if you look at the key drivers of profit of, of, of its success, namely, you know, what is its, how fast has it been growing its revenues, what is its return on capital, you'll find that there are vast differences across a company, okay. right? Uh, and that's important uh, because uh, if you're going to improve, whether you're thinking about acquiring a company or if you're just managing a company, right, you can't, you can't manage every part of the business the same way, right? right? If you've got some growing business units, you have to help them grow. And if you've got some stagnant business units that maybe their market is mature, Maybe they should focus on cost cutting, right? Okay. So looking at the company as a whole. So one of the one of the things that I think companies fall into a trap in to say, okay, we're going to do cost cutting this year, right? And so everybody has to cut costs, including the newer businesses which have tremendous growth opportunities and should be focusing on growth, not cutting costs, right? Mm, right. Uh, and so the chance, you know, so so the way that you create value. Uh, with a company is not by, you know, if you're the CEO of a company, is not by saying, oh, you know, it's not by having broad, big programs that everybody has to follow typically, right? right. It, is, it is by figuring out what is the right strategy and what are the right metrics uh, and, and what is for each unit, right, that has its own sort of economic characteristics gotcha. because you have to tailor it. And that's what makes it difficult. You know, and, 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 and you can't just look at a big company as a big company and sort of draw any conclusions because it's always made up of, is, you know, parts, some of which are doing better than others, some of which are early in their life, some of which are very mature. Right. Um, everything is, you know, you have to look at, 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 at it at a granular level. Obviously, you can't go down to the level of, you know, a thousand units, depending on how big you are, right? Right. But if you're the CEO of a large company, you know, Maybe you should be looking at it at the level of 60 units, right? Or maybe if you're a mid-sized company, you still should be looking at it at the level of 10 units, right? right. Or 10 geographies, because they, they may have, you know, if you're a, if you're a, 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 restaurant, a, a medium-sized restaurant chain, right? right? You might find that there are differences uh, in different cities or different types of locations, right? right. Um, whether they're in big cities or small cities and stuff like that. So you always need to go down a couple levels if you're going to make, you know, important decisions uh, to, to really maximize value. 
I heard that. I heard that. Thank you so much. And when you talked about, you know, looking at uh, business at a granular, granular level, it goes back to that other question I asked you when I was talking about, like, you know, how can those big businesses be kind of failing when we see them as successes? But, you know, like you said, there's there's something at the granular level, obviously, uh, that's going on there. Once again, Startup Nation, we are talking to Tim Kohler, the lead author of Value uh, I want to ask you this, Tim, you know, you know, you help, you know, consult it with a lot of companies uh, and stuff like that. You know, when you decide to say, you know, I'm kind of done with this, I'm gonna go fishing. Uh, what do you hope all the clients that you that you've worked with will say about you? I love that question. Uh, because, you. Um, you know, I have been doing this for 30 years. Um, and what what is always satisfying is if I go back to a company that I haven't seen for a couple of years, right? Right. And um, they remember the conversations that we had. Maybe we had a workshop. Uh, maybe we did a consulting project. Maybe we just did some counseling. And it changed their thinking about the way they think about their business, right? Mm, gotcha. Um, and so that's what I'm always looking for. I, I'm always that, that, that's what makes me most satisfied is when when clients look back and say that you know you 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 taught us something that stuck with us that was universal that we weren't thinking about uh, and that we use it still today five years later ten years later those ideas and they've, and they've lasted and, and, and they've made a big difference. Gotcha. Um, that's, that's really what, um, what, you know, where I get my greatest sense of satisfaction. Gotcha. I heard that. Thank you for sharing that. So when you do decide to, you know, if you decide to hang it up or whatever the case may be, what would you do? Would you go fishing? Would you take up any new hobbies? What, what would be next? What would be the next chapter? Um, well, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, after 30 years, I am trying to contemplate that right now. Fair enough. Um, uh, and, and, and probably what I'm, my current thinking is that I would like to stay at McKinsey doing a lot of what I'm doing. I've already turned over a lot of my managerial responsibilities, okay. right? Uh, and so I focus primarily on, um, helping my colleagues with their clients. Okay. Gotcha. Which I enjoy a lot. Um, you know, getting called in to help my client, help, help clients solve difficult problems, help or, or run workshops with clients to teach them new things and stuff like that. Of I intend to do that. Um, and I, and I love working on advancing the knowledge. You know, when three clients have a question, the same question, you know, that there's a lot of other people out there with the question and it's worth doing some research on mm -hmm. to figure out what the right answer is. Uh, so I, I intend to do that. I just, I just would hope I'm planning on doing it at a, at a, at a slower pace. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and so instead of, you know, uh, full time, probably, uh, you know, uh, uh, three day a week type of schedule okay. kind of thing instead of, a, uh, instead of a full, full schedule for, for, for the foreseeable future. Um, I also like to lecture, uh, at, okay. in, in schools, do that a little bit. Um, I also would love to, um, get more involved in, um, I'm involved in some nonprofits. So I'd like to put more time in there. Um, uh, uh, in two areas, one is in ed education and one is in sort of um, uh, helping to educate people or helping to do research on um, on, 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 on economic topic, topic issues. And then I also finally, and I don't want to underemphasize this, um, uh, I want to make more time, and this is probably one of the most important things, okay. uh, especially in the, you know, it, it, you know it, it, as you get older, uh, more time for riding my bike, uh, okay. exercising, uh, and traveling with my wife. Got you. Got you. Okay. What, what were that? If you're traveling with your wife, what's that one destination you got to go to? What's that one destination? Uh, well, we've done lots of them. Um, so, um, Australia, New Zealand is sort of one that because it's so far away, we've never done before. Okay. Um, so that's probably uh, high on our list just because of its remoteness. Fair enough. We, we, we lived in Europe for five years uh, as part of McKinsey. Right, because you're Amsterdam, uh, so, right? And I was in the Amsterdam office for right. five years. So we spent a lot of time traveling around Europe. So we know Europe quite well. There are still some places to see in Europe, uh, but, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Asia probably be the places that uh, – that we focus on. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. If I were to ask, you know, one of your clients or one of your partners or anybody you work with there at McKinsey, 
if I was to ask them, what's, what's Tim's superpower? What would they tell me and why? Um, I think my superpower, um, and, and from what people have told me is the, uh, ability to, to, to make things as simple as they can to get across the idea. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always, um, like, I think it was Einstein who, who said, you know, you, you know, the goal should be to make something as simple as it as possibly can, but not too simple, right? That right. where you lose the essence, right? Uh, and I think that's what I always try to do when I talk to audience because they, you know, executives got a lot of things, a lot of input, you know, um, uh, I teach, for example, I do run workshops for marketing executives, um, and they're not that different than what I would talk to with the CEO or the CFO, but they've got so many things going on. They want to know the essence of what is important to remember. So I, 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 when I, I think my superpower is to try to reduce things down to their essence, simplify them so that people can remember them and act on them. Right. Right. Um, and so, you know, you know, take, give you an example. I may know a lot about cost of capital Mm -hmm. and how to measure it. And and I could debate it with academics and, and, and stuff like that. Right. But the reality of it is, you know, most senior executives, even CFOs don't need to know much about it. Right. Right. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm going to spend more time saying, okay, what really matters to your business, right. Right. Is, you know, revenue growth and return on capital. Right. And I'll spend a lot of time, uh, uh, you know, just giving examples, showing how those work so that they come across with the tools that they need to run the business without all the extraneous complications um, that someone needs. You know, there's someone in the accounting department needs to know how to do the accounting. But, you know, you know, we don't need to sort of have all those qualifiers. We want to get right to the heart of what are the things that really make a difference and and and. It reminds me of there's a, there was a, um, a a mathematics professor from the University of Texas who, okay. who said uh, the typical calculus textbook consists of two ideas and 1198 pages of examples and illustrations, right? <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of fields are like that, and I think finance is like that as well. And so we've tried to condense, you know, what are the key things you need to know, uh, the four or five things you need to know to really help you think about value creation, solve finance problems, uh, and, 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 and really get down to the essence of what is going to make a difference here uh, and not get sort of caught up by the peripheral things. I think that's my superpower. I hear that. And I appreciate that because I know a lot of times, you know, when we're talking about what you do, Tim, there's a lot of things where it's just kind of like, oh, man, that's a lot. And so to have that superpower is extremely important, uh, I imagine. So I, I appreciate you sharing that for yeah. sure. Yeah. And I also, it also comes out in the way you, and also, it also comes out in how you talk, how you, the words that you use, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I, it drives me crazy when, when, when consultants and bankers and uh, lawyers use jargon, right? right. Uh, and yeah. you don't need jargon. You know, you, you can use simple words and it's a lot more effective. You, you know, you don't need to prove to people how smart you are by using, you know, jargon or fancy words. Uh, you'll be a lot more effective. Uh, in convincing people something, if you use, explain it using the most, you know, typical, simple language that possible. For sure. And, and Tim, I appreciate you saying that so much. That reminds me, uh, my wife uh, it was an educator for 12 years and she always talked about the, uh, the, the effect of filter. And so when you use jargon, a lot of times that effect of filter goes up. And so the main message that you're trying to get across doesn't get them across because you're trying to use all these big words and jargon. So I definitely, exactly. I definitely appreciate uh, you saying that for Sure. Uh, once again, Startup Nation, before I ask my last question, just want to say thank you uh, to Tim Kohler, the lead author of Valuation, Measuring and Managing the Value of Companies. That book is out today, Startup Nation. Go to the link in the show notes if you're listening to the replay on the podcast. And also, if you want to check out uh, McKinsey and Company, make sure you go to McKinsey.com. We have that link there in the show notes as well. But Tim, uh, I'm actually going to turn the microphone over to you because there's somebody out there 
in Startup Nation that's feeling a little down on their sales, they're feeling a little discouraged with everything going on, and you've had a very successful career, if you would, just kind of give us some words of encouragement to take us out for today, if you would, sir. Yeah, I think the words of encouragement I would give are, you know, everyone I know in my career has had some down, some periods, you know, where it looked like things weren't going well, including myself, um, you know, where things just weren't, you know, clicking. Um, and, um, you know, I think the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you, you know, you learn from your failures, um, and that you persevere, uh, and stick it out and, you know, things will then work out. I think that's the main thing that I've learned in, in, in my career. And I would say many of the people that I've known would, you know, that are very successful would, would say the same thing. And you don't know where things are going to take you. Um, you know, and don't, don't have too rigid of a set of goals, be flexible in terms of what you're trying to accomplish, but learn from your mistakes. And, and also the other thing that's also important is, you know, to, to be, to, to, to focus on things that you're passionate about. Right. Um, and that's what I've done as well. And, you know, it's taken me in a different course than a lot of my colleagues, uh, even though, you know, at, at McKinsey, I have a very unique career at McKinsey because I've followed what, what I felt was important to me and, and made, and made me excited. Uh, and that's why, you know, that, and that helps with success as well. I hear that. I know that was probably more than one thing, but you know, oh, no. all those, all those things combined. No, yeah. we appreciate all of that, Tim. Thank you so much. And that's going to wrap up this session of the startup life. Tim Kohler, it was a pleasure, sir. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We really appreciate your time. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me, Dominic. No worries. And as always, Startup Nation, if you have an idea, be about that life. The startup life. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, If you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.